as spring begins to grow and the flowers bud and things warm up, my heart, of course, goes to summer pastimes. Um, some of you guys know that I'm a racing fan, and today is the first race of the new Indianapolis League season, so I'm really excited to go home and play back the DVR. Um, but of course, there are other summer pastimes and other sports, and one of the biggest ones in our country is baseball. Um, and that brings to mind the story of two lifelong friends, Bob and Earl, who were quintessential baseball fans. Bob and Earl uh, spent every winter poring over baseball trivia and baseball history. And come the season, they were out there for the first game and probably attended as many as 60 games in the season. They kept every statistic on every player in every team. They even had a secret pact. Whichever one of them died first would try to come back and tell the other if there was baseball in heaven. <laughs> well, as it worked out, Bob passed away one night quietly in his sleep after watching his beloved Yankees rack up another victory. A few days later, Earl wakes up in the middle of the night hearing Bob's voice. Bob, is that you? Well, of course it's me, Earl. I promised you that if I went first, I'd come back and tell you. Well, yes, tell me. Is there baseball in heaven? What's the news? Well, Earl, I have good news and I have bad news. Well, just, just give it to me, Bob. Bob says, well, the good news is that there is baseball in heaven. Earl says, that's fantastic, Bob. How could there be any bad news after that? There's baseball in heaven. Well, Earl, the bad news is that you're pitching tomorrow night. <laughs> now, Paul, as we heard in our second reading, would probably turn that around and say, that's not bad news either. That's what it's all about. I want to be there. I'm pushing hard to reach the goal of life eternal with Christ. And in his usual fashion, Paul used great rhetoric to build the moment as he, as he sends this letter. Even talking about his former life as a Jewish man and a Pharisee and the way he lived before he came to know Jesus. And he says it was all a waste. I count it as nothing compared to the life I have in Christ. And then as Paul likes to do frequently, he weaves into the rhetoric a little conversation about the issue of the day, whether Gentile converts needed to become Jewish before they could become Christian, or if they had to do it all together, or whatever. And we get that little conversation about circumcision. But even that, he flips around again. The real mark of our belonging to God is internal. It's not external. It's in the heart, not in the flesh. And push, and strive, and grow in that full person Christ called me to. In our first lesson, we have that piece of the writings of the prophet Isaiah that were done during the Babylonian exile, during the captivity. Almost certainly, the prophet is concerned about those people who have lost faith in God. We lost our homeland, we've been conquered, we've been taken away, we've been here now for a couple of generations, it's not good and God's not going to divorce. The prophet's message is God is already doing a new thing for you. It's already happening. It's already taking place. Don't be so fixated on the past that you miss what God is doing right now. He will bring it home. And it will be glorious. 
our gospel story. We have one of John's many little vignettes that is one layer of symbols and stories wrapped on top of another layer of symbols and stories and so on and so forth. It's not a simple little story about tensions and gripes between Jesus' disciples. On the first level, John presents to us a complaint from Judas about an extravagant expression of devotion for Jesus. And sometimes we miss just why this is such a big deal. This perfume, this 300 denarii, we're talking almost a year's wages for a laborer. But John makes it very clear that Judas is really not being altruistic about it. He's a thief, and he wants to take his skin off of the value of that thing. Below the surface of that, that next layer of peeling them down, you have to remember that for John, Jesus is God. There's no equivocation, there's no hemming and hawing, there's no qualifiers. He starts out his gospel from the very first word all the way to the end, hammering this point over and over again. Jesus is God, come down from heaven to live among us. So Mary performs a very fitting, humble, passionate act of worship and is defended by Jesus as appropriate as we dig down yet another layer we get into what has been a perennial tension among Christians from obviously very early on to the present day <laughs> is it more important to invest in worship and worship space, beautiful thing, to spend our income on caring for the poor, the event, the suffering. And the response we get, woven into John's description of how Jesus defends Mary, is that they're not supposed to be pitted against one another. Yes, in the context of the story, they won't have Jesus very long. He's going to go away. But by the time John is writing this, a generation or maybe even two later, they know Jesus is still with them. They feel his presence, they share holy communion. They know he's here. <laughs> What they also know is that there's always still suffering in the world. We human beings have a tendency to want to simplify stuff, to boil it down, to say this is what's most important. What we've been given in our Christian tradition is an organic whole. Things that are to be held together. It's not an either-or proposition. And we heard that in the quotation from Jesus that we started our service with and we've been starting every Sunday with uh, during Lent. When challenged by his adversaries about what is the most important, Jesus gives a double answer. Love God with all your being. Let yourself really and truly fall in love with the one who created you and loves you and holds you in existence. And love your neighbor as you love yourself. It's a package deal. What you and I do here today, the way we express our devotion, our love for God, our desire for God to fill our lives. 
is part and parcel of what it is to live our faith. What we do each time we drop a donation in the basket for the children's clinic at Nogales, or the chaplain's footlocker, or carry out any other action of compassion and love. We're living out what is part and parcel, inseparable from the faith that we inherit. It's all about love. And there's another message woven in there that we don't talk about very often. If I'm going to love my neighbor as myself, that means I'm also called to love me. God loves me. God made me. God asks me to love him back. God asks us to love each other the way we love ourselves. We tend to miss the preciousness with which God sees us and holds us. That's the invitation Jesus came to offer us. To accept the love of God, love God in return, to love ourselves as God loves us, to love our neighbor as we love ourselves.